All right, Reggie Sr., I appreciate you coming back on the show. I know a lot of people really appreciate it and love the stories that you shared last time. So I'm excited to ask for a couple more, if that's all right. Yeah, it's okay with me. Okay. Um, to start off, can you tell me some stories um, uh, from people that you remember that were part of uh, Santana Block Crips, like Turtle or Gangster or Melly Mel? Well, Turtle... Uh, Kenneth Dwayne Johnson. He, he was kind of close to him. I, I, I really took to him. Um, only, I guess, because I had known of him and his family when I was working for the Edison Company. My, my job at the Edison Company, part of it, was to collect light bills, basically. And over in that area where he was living on Roll Street, I had to spend a lot of time over there, uh, you know, trying to collect the light bills for families. And uh, I had to go to his home a couple of times. And his mother was a real nice lady, real nice lady. I think she, single mom, had a few kids. And uh, I used to, I guess I could say it now because I'm getting in trouble, but myself coming from a large family and living in the projects and the imperial courts and stuff, I remember my mama hiding from the the light uh, man c coming to collect. So I had a little mixed emotion about my job. So I had to, in order to keep my job, I had to turn off lights sometime for people who couldn't make the payment. But right when I turned it off, I would show somebody in the family how to turn it back on. <laughs> my records were sure it was on. And uh, I remember... Uh, Turtle's older brother, uh, I, I would show him how to turn the lights back on. So they always kind of respected me. So when I became a police officer, <coughs> a year or two after that, um, I encountered uh, Turtle and them. They were forming their little Santana Block Crips at that time. And, um, you know, naturally, if I had any dealings with them or anything, I always got the utmost respect. And um, so... I, you know, I really felt real bad the day that I heard that he was shot in Linwood right after he had gotten out of jail for something. But that's a uh, turtle. But gangster Freddie Stage sort of like stepped in uh, in the leadership part of the Santana block. Uh, he started ga gaining that same respect that turtle had, a uh, uh, gangster. I had the same relationship with him for the same reasons uh, of working that area and going to his house before and knowing his family prior to that Santana block uh, formulation, formalizing themselves as gangsters. And got the utmost respect from him as well. There were a lot of situations that went down. And only thing I would do, I'd contact Freddie, you know, and say, hey, this individual did this or that or they did this, and he would see to them that they'll basically turn themselves into me, you know, and answer for what was going on. So I always had that kind of respect for for Freddie as well, you know. Uh, and his little brothers, they sort of like uh, Freddie did, respected me and my role, you know, in dealing with them. So it worked out real well. Now Melly Mel, I didn't really have a lot of contact with him. Uh, because he was quiet, like, I mean, he didn't step out like like they did. I mean, I met him and saw him hanging out and probably F.I.'d him a couple of times. But he always, to me, seemed like the smart one, or one of the smart ones. It was a couple of them, but uh, Melly Mel definitely was one of the ones that he would talk with you and stuff. But it was always at a more intellectual basis. <laughs> So, but as far as gang banging activity and all that kind of stuff, I never uh, had that experience with him, Melly Mel. Okay. Um, are there any more members of Santana Blocks that that stick out in your mind that you can that you can speak on that you had dealings with? Well, another little interesting character. Matter of fact, when I got on the sheriff department uh, and was working Twin Towers over the, uh, at LCMC, over the uh, medical unit over there, 
I saw him. This was about mm, eight or ten years ago. But at the time, Santana was my, I guess the one I used to like to challenge all the time. And that was Robert Jones. They called him Bay Rab. Or not, Bay Rob was Robert Franklin, but Rabbit. Uh, bad Habit Rabbit. Now you're talking about an interesting young man. Very smart. But by the same token, could be ignorant at the same time. You know, that was Rabbit. I mean, every time I'd go over there and deal with something like that, I would get a challenge from him. Not disrespectfully, but, you know, he wanted to prove he was the smart guy, you know, in the group. And, um, but he never did anything real serious. Like, I used to tell him he wasn't hard. He just wanted to profess to be hard. You know, he, he, he wasn't hard. Uh, but he was a very interesting character. Then again, um, the other ones that stick out naturally, uh, were the Hartsfields family. And that was, uh, Hub, Herbert uh, Hartsfield, uh, my na name's just slipping me right now. And the oldest one that was kind of pretty intelligent too. Not the oldest one. That was, uh, Jenny, you might can help me with SAG, SAG. I mean, I think he has a, a podcast now. Uh, he was one of the brothers. And then I'm, I'm trying to think of the one, he was a taller one. He was in the, uh, a little younger than, uh, the other Hartsfield. It was three of them, three brothers. They all was active, very active. But the unique part about dealing with them, their father was a reserve police officer with us. At the time I got on, his father had kind of retired from a reserve position. <clears throat> But every time I'd have little problems with them, I would go to their dad, and he would check them quick. So most of their activity was kind of behind them. But my favorite Santana, go to say other than maybe Turtle or Gangster, was a female. <laughs> and that was the Hartsfield sister, uh, Joanne. Oh, man, I, that girl was a character. I mean, from the crip side, uh, she was like my Cynthia Nunn or my Sylvia Nunn. Uh, I don't know if she was as hard as Sylvia, but Joanne, she, you could deal with her, but uh, she would keep it mellow or, or you know, uh, if it was some of them wanted to act stupid, she would tell them they better chill out. That's why I compared her to Cynthia Nunn and Sylvia because I had that same kind of respect from a female who had some clout in uh, Pie Roots and Luda Spark and all that. Uh, Joanne Hartsfield was that way. J-Bo. Are there any more um, uh, really active people from Santana Block that you remember other than the ones that you spoke on a few minutes ago? Yeah, I just thought about uh, the twins, Angelito and Angelo. Uh, those uh, were two blood brothers. Matter of fact, they were twins. <laughs> At that matter, one we used to call Grill because he had all his front teeth. And then the other one, how we distinguished him, he didn't have no upper front teeth. So we used to call them one grill and one no grill. Uh, but those char characters, and I, we lost one. One of them got killed in a big uh, gang, how would you say it? Not a rivalry, because they both were hanging out. Another set from Linwood, uh, and the Santanas got into it over some girl or some dope or whatever. And they had a car chase where one of the twins was in this chase where the guys from Linwood was chasing them down Santa Fe, uh, shooting at them. I mean, an actual OK Corral shootout from Linwood down to the uh, south end of uh, Compton on Santa Fe, uh, just shooting at each other. And uh, unfortunately, uh twin crashed on the south end. I think this was Angelito. Um, I'm not sure. One of the two crashed uh, out on the south end near the 91 freeway. And they ended up kidnapping him. Like, once he crashed, they went and took him out of the crash and took him over to Johnson Street over in the uh, Spook Town little area and tortured him and shot and killed him. Uh, but he was active, and they were doing a lot. The other one still alive today somewhere. I haven't talked to him in years, the other twin. But those two characters, I mean, they were deadly. <laughs> I mean, uh, but... And they weren't even from the area either. Matter of fact, I think they lived uh, 
decent location somewhere in a, uh, off of Gardena or near Gardena somewhere. Uh, but they were very active, Angelito and Angelo. Okay. Um, can you tell me a, a little bit about um, some of the members of the Southside Crips, like um, the ones that come to mind are Little Al, um, Orlando, of course, Big Dre, of course, and then even Keefe D, as far as if you had any interactions with him. Well, you, you said Al first, uh, and I'm glad you did, because I go back with him since he was a baby. Um, his, uh, his mother, uh, Carrie Doro, worked for us, or worked with us, I should put it in that sense. Uh, she was a property officer for Compton PD for years. And uh, so I knew her and then met her, I mean, met Lil Al when he was a baby through Carrie. Matter of fact, at the time I didn't know it, but I subsequently found out that Lil Al, uh, he, Michael DeRoe Jr., uh, uh, he and Orlando Anderson, uh, uh, Baby Lane, were raised together because their mother were friends. Matter of fact, I remember my mother telling me about when they were like in twin strollers when they were babies. Well, Orlando in one and Al in the other one with their mother and, uh, and Carrie, you know, together. So... When I found out that Al was hanging out in Southside with Orlando and them, uh, I was I was a little surprised, wondering how they connected. But then I subsequently found out that they connected as babies. But <clears throat> both of them were active Southsiders. I mean, they 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 weren't no joke. But again, not so much Orlando because I didn't know much about him. I knew of him and his family through my Edison days as well. But I didn't deal with him as much as I did with Al. Utmost respect. I mean, and, but they knew, even back like the ones I, I talked about before with gangsters and all that, if they'd done something wrong and they were caught up in something, I would come after them, you know, but I would deal with them in a decent way. So uh, that relationship was okay. And like I said, with Orlando, I knew of him, but not much about him. The other South Sider that I was close to because of being raised around me uh, in terms of uh, off duty, if, so to speak, um, was Grim. Um, uh, Grim, I, I said Grim. He, matter of fact, he was the first person, Big Grim, to get shot uh, on that rivalry or that retaliation from the Tupac uh, shooting and shield shooting in Vegas. Uh, when the blood started retaliating, Brim uh, was coming out of a store the next day after the shooting in Vegas. Uh, him and uh, walking out of a store, him and some little girl, I don't think she was with him. She just happened to be coming out the store at the time. And they shot Brim. I think they shot and killed that little girl or something. But she, uh, <coughs> Reggie probably can help me to recollect that, but I don't really know if the girl died or what, but it was shooting involving Darnell, Darnell Brim, I said Brim, but his name is Darnell Brim. Uh, had a good relationship with him because quite frankly, him and his sister, my wife, we had babysitted mainly the sister when they were like hmm, 10, 11 years old. For a matter of fact, his sister was a good friend of my daughter. So I knew these guys, so I always got it, but Brim was active. You know, a Darnell, and uh, had those interactions with him. But you mentioned Keefe D. Hmm. I knew of Keefe D, and I knew of his family. Same reason, my Edison days and all that. But I never had any interaction with Keefe D at all, for the most part. Uh, I know we talked before in one of the podcasts or something where Keefe D said, uh, I came to his house or something, and he was standing out there, and I don't know if he was talking about it. he could have off me or wanted to or, or some mess he talked about. But till today, I still don't remember talking to him. I did go to his house uh, right after all that shooting had occurred, and the word on the street was they were going to take out Reggie because of his involvement or something in death row, you know, and being out there when the shooting occurred and all that. I, at that time, was taken off of the case by the chief because it was a conflict 
in me remaining as a supervisor or something over the shootings that was going on because, excuse me, of the conflict of Mob, Pyrus, and Reggie in the South Sider. So I was working upstairs, but I heard it that this rumor or whatever. So I beelined over, and I don't remember, I think I was in a plane car. I might have been in a patrol car because I had access to both. And got over to his house right quick because, as I said, I knew the family, you know. And when uh, I went over there to confront him about, I was looking for Orlando, to tell you the truth. Um, so I could confront him about nothing better ever happened to Reggie, you know, or behind all whatever was going on. And I do remember when I got out the car, there was people outside, uh, guys standing around the house. But I didn't fit, none of them was Orlando. I, I wouldn't knew Orlando. But like I said before, I wouldn't have knew Keefe D if he kissed me. You know, I, 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 I just didn't have no recollection. I know there were Southside guys out front. And I didn't recall saying anything to any of them because they weren't Orlando. I went straight to the house to go in the house to see if he was there or talk to uh, his family, his mother. From uh, I believe was there at the time. I believe that's the female I talked to, as I recall, when I was let into the house. And I explained myself and explained my concerns about Reggie. And then I left. Now, going out of the house, I do remember talking to somebody out front, you know, basically saying about Reggie, you know, nobody been to mess with Reggie or whatever, and got in my car and left. But... That was the extent of it. I had no idea it was Keefe D until he started talking about it on, uh, on some of his interviews or something. But I didn't have that much contact with Keefe D. He was, t I, I known him as the dope dealer because I know my narcotic guys, like Bobby Baker and them was working, him and some of the other guys from Southside that were involved in narcotics. That never was my main uh, concerns. Were there any other cell sides that um, stick out that maybe people aren't super familiar with as far as, um, you know, the whole Vegas well, situation? Were there any older school ones? Well, I started dealing with the South Sides when a lot of stuff was going on outside of, before the Tupac shooting uh, with the South Side with Lando and Al and even after the um, shooting that occurred in Vegas, uh, Al and... In uh, Orlando, getting not, yeah, Orlando getting involved in the shooting where Orlando got killed, you know that that was that. But the other person that was doing a lot of things with those two was Big Dre, who I've heard really believe that he was one of the passengers in the vehicle uh, in the Cadillac when Keefe D got uh, correction. I don't know why I said Keefe D, Lord, but anyway. Uh, Dre was in the car. Well, I know why I said Keefe D. I'm, I'm sort of recalling things as I'm talking to you, John. But um, he, Keefe D was also in the vehicle, as I, the information that I gathered. Um, but anyway, Big Dre, uh, he was a real active guy. And I think in some statements, somebody saying Dre started the shooting first or something, and Orlando took the gun from him. I don't know how that went. I know Keefe D made some statements about what happened in the vehicle, but uh, Big Dre was a character. I mean, and he was called Big Dre for a reason. I mean, this brother was every bit of about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, if not bigger, in muscle. Wow, he, I used to call him Lando's bodyguard, because every time you would see Lando, you would see Big Dre. But, so that's some of the guys on the uh, south side. Can you explain to me how um, Sergeant Bobby Baker found the car that the South Sides were um, supposedly driving the white Cadillac in Vegas when they shot it at Tupac and Suge? Okay. As I forestated, I was taken off of the direct street investigation uh, of the shootings that were occurring as a result of the Vegas uh, shooting. Uh, Sergeant Baker, Robert Baker, was more or less took my position as far as being the uh, direct supervisor. And so he was getting a lot of information from Ladd and Brennan and Aguirre and, and Ray that was out there from our team getting information on the shooter, the involvements and all that. Bobby Baker had an informant who uh, uh, came to him and told him that next day 
described the vehicle that was used, the white Cadillac, kind of told him who was in it, and told him that they had rented it from an enterprise uh, car rental place, I think in Long Beach or North Long Beach somewhere. So Bobby sent one of the other investigators, I think it was Pilcher, Andrew Pilcher or somebody, over to that rental car agency. And he did find paperwork of a vehicle that was uh, the, a white Cadillac was rented by Brown, the kid that was supposed to be driving the car. What was his name? Uh, T. Brown or something like that. He was the other fourth person that was supposed to be in the vehicle. But it was registered to his relative. I'm not sure if it was an aunt or mother or, or somebody. The car was ready. And Bobby had gotten all the paperwork and stuff showing that a connection with that white vehicle. And the informant also indicated that the vehicle had bullet holes in it. And it was kind of repaired at this body shop over here on the Londra in uh, Washington, which the South Sides, uh, they would always be hanging up there. You know, they they hang up, uh, would be up there gambling, selling a little dope, whatever, at that body shop. So that was all the connection. It was subsequently turned over to uh, Las Vegas PD, but their interest in what we gathered, I, that's that's a story for another day. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the people in the Mob Pyrus that, that people know about as far as like the Herons or Lip Dog or Trayvon or Buntry? Kind of any of those guys that you have any stories about? Lip. Lip. Uh, yeah. Uh, I go back with him and I meant to, uh, as I'm thinking, I'm looking at Reggie right now because he can really help me. I mean, we're talking about 30-some years ago. Uh, I know of incidents, but I may get something a little twisted with names or something, so I might refer to him to help me uh, to uh, talk about this incident. But I remember we were living on Pine at the time, right in the middle of mob, and uh, Lip, as I recall, he tried to rob our gardener uh, over there, right almost at the corner of my house, Pine and Bradfield. But I think it was a kid that I also knew that played a little basketball with. I think that's when Glenn Christmas, Glenn Christmas was a kid. Yeah, Reggie's nodding that he agree with me uh, with the rec recalling what happened. But those two got arrested for uh, uh, robbing the gardener uh, at that time. And I, I remember kind of talking with Lip later on, but I never had that much contact because he went to jail for a good while. And I think when Reggie really... Uh, was working death row and that that him and lip kind of reunited, but I never had that much contact with him. Oh yeah, murder. I mean, they killed the guard. Now, Reggie is reminding me that the incident was a homicide. And that's why Lip and Glenn uh, spent a long time. Yeah, you know. but when I say a long time, it was a long time for juvenile because I think they both were about sixteen or seventeen, so they didn't stay life for thirty years or nothing like that. They got out in a short time, I think before they were 25. But that was Lip, uh, uh, as far as his thing. Heron uh, was a pyro uh, from Luther's. He was actually OG Luther's. And uh, crazy, crazy as a bed bug. Uh, but every time, again, these cats, for some reason, if I go to talk to them and stuff like that, they have decent conversation. They never disrespect or go off. And I know Heron because he was short and loud. Like me, I mean, every time I would talk to him, he would get real loud and all this and all that, and I used to have to calm him down. But um, he eventually did something crazy because I remember rolling to the incident where he had gotten shot. Apparently, they had some big uh, <clears throat> event at uh, the park, at Gonzalez Park, over there on the west side of Compton, and it was blood-on-blood -blood type of incidents uh, or Rivalry, or not, not rivalry, blood on blood involvements, you know. And they were after Heron. And apparently when Heron left to go back to the mob area, he went down Rosecrans. And the crazy part about it is he was in his car. And about two cars behind Heron on Santa Fe and Rosecrans, going eastbound on Rosecrans at Santa Fe, was a big fire truck with firemen on the truck. But when he stopped waiting for the red light, all of a sudden this car comes around 
and kind of block him right there at that intersection and got out the car and lit him up. Uh, so uh, we subsequently found the car and the people involved and found out they were Piru. But the crazy part about it, they did it right in front of the firemen and everybody, you know, so they were good witnesses, uh, the firemen. But that's the day that Heron got killed. And the actual motive for that, Reggie might can talk to more about that. I don't, I don't recall what it was about, but it was a some type of internal uh, conflict with, with that group. Yeah. That was Heron. Oh, yeah. Well, Trayvon, um, again, Trayvon see me, I go back with these guys. Where Trayvon lived with his grandfather about eight houses from where Reggie was raised, and we were living on Pine. And uh, his, uh, my daughter kind of, you know, hung down there with Trayvon, and then because the grandfather had a pool, and all the kids uh, from the area would always go down there, and, you know, Trayvon would come up, up to my house and, you know, with Kim and that kind of stuff. So I kind of knew Trayvon. But uh, I found out that Trayvon Lane was the young man that uh, apparently they attempted to take the death row chain from in Lakewood, take from him. And he was the main one that was involved with that, with Orlando being one of the culprits who tried to take his chain. And subsequently, that night at the fight is when uh, Trayvon saw Orlando pointed him out, and then Tupac got involved, and I guess most of y'all know how all that went down. But uh, that's Trayvon. Uh, it was somebody else that uh, you referred to that was caught up in that uh, mob stuff. Well, yeah, Buntry. Again, I think I talked before, and Reggie uh, talked. Well, that's Mob James' brother, Buntry. Okay. You know, uh, and uh, they lived two doors from my mother's house and kind of uh, knew them, you know, coming up. Uh, but they were active, <laughs> you know, uh, Mob, uh, Timmy, Timmy Rue, and Buntry, you know, Alton, that's Alton McDonald. But one big incident that <laughs> I, I remember vividly that I always had concerns, you know, about their activity and so close to my mom's house and all that, but they always respected the family. They, both side, both families always talked a lot and all that. But one day I go over to my mom's house and uh, <laughs> I see a police car. Uh, you know, they had, I was off duty, but they had surrounded the house, the, the block. <clears throat> and they had Mob James in the car and Timothy. Uh, some guys apparently were over by the, the store. And I'm certain if you heard Mob stories, you would hear about this. This grocery store, almost in Linwood, uh, off of Waldar, uh, I forget what they used to call it. They had a name for Aikens. it. Aikens. Aikens Market. Okay, um, I was talking about the incident at Aikens Market where, where James was over there at Aikens. And apparently James had a nice car with some Dayton's on it or something. And these guys from another set, uh, somewhere near L.A. or some Pyrus guys, too, uh, they apparently was going to try to... Uh, Jack, uh, Mob James for, for his Dayton's or something. But when Mob um, left the store, he, I guess, saw these guys following him or casing him out and knew something was about to go down. <laughs> he called, uh, Timmy, who was at home and told Timmy these guys are following him. <coughs> so Timmy kind of armed himself and came out when James got to the house. He got out and they armed himself and they were looking and those cats was parked on the side street. And they started shooting at him. The other guys started shooting at Timmy and Mom. And then that's when they both returned to fire. And they had that, uh, got involved. And one of those guys got killed. And I ended up uh, talking to both of them because they wouldn't talk to the police. And they kind of told the story. And that's how I think they beat the case of self-defense. Okay. Um, do you have any stories about... Um Mob members Bob Gotti or, or K Dub, do you have any recollection of, of interactions with them? No, K Dub was always smooth. I I, uh, <laughs> I met K Dub and his family through my Edison days, so I knew him prior to all this mob stuff. But K Dub, I never knew him to be a banger or anything. I mean, he associated with the guy, grew up with him, and stuff like that. But no, I never had no negative uh, contact with K Dub. 
<laughs> Who was the other individual you said? Excuse me. Uh, Bob Gotti. Oh, Gotti. That's my man. Oh, uh, I thought, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, Gotti, the same way I met him through my Edison days, <laughs> you know, and he was older than the groups we're talking about. Uh, and uh, we kind of, you know, talked and stuff. And he knew my son. He knew of Reggie and, and Sugar and them. And so, uh, but he always was straight. I mean, but uh, I had one incident that occurred. I remember at his house. He was living on Ward uh, in some duplexes. And some guys from uh, Atlantic Drive was selling a little stuff. And I guess Mob was involved a little bit in that. But some guys came over to jack him. Uh, not necessarily Gotti, but the guy that from Atlantic, because they were out of the, the neighborhood. They were Crips. And some of the Pyrus saw him. And so they were going to, uh, I forget his name. It's coming to me. But uh, but they tried to jack him in front of Gotti's house. And uh, I think somebody got, I know definitely got shot. I don't know if they got killed in that incident. But uh, it's right in front of Gotti's house. But uh, they, didn't, they wasn't coming after Gotti. They, the guys that were Jack, uh, and uh, I had to interview Jack Gotti behind that and stuff. So uh, that was my first real encounter with Gotti in anything kind of crazy. But other than that, when he started uh, working at Death Row and stuff, you know, uh, I would talk to him and stuff. But he's always pops. He used to call me pops also, uh, Gotti. But that was my relationship with him. Okay. Um can you tell me a little bit about some of the people that were really active um, from Imperial Courts projects, um, you know, that you had you know, spoken well, on you wanna uh, go, in the last interview? You sound like you want to go back a little bit. I mean, yeah. I was in this era. Yeah. That takes me back to uh, before, really, I got on the uh, uh, police department as a reserve. That was the time I, t I think I t was telling you about my Tookie, uh, yeah. Tookie Williams incident when, when he had struck my father and stuff. Uh, but that yeah. was... Uh, Back then, I spoke of Anthony Blaylock, uh, who was A.B., and in my opinion, he was the one who really got the P.J. Cripps started uh, back in that, that time. That had to be 75 or 76 when all that was going down. And Anthony Blaylock was another young man who uh, was quite involved, but knew him since he was small. He uh, played baseball for me and everything. Uh, but... Uh, he got caught up. I think he got killed. Robin Church's chicken over there on the Imperial. I guess the police shot and killed me. AB back in 75 or something like that, uh, 76. Uh, that, he was the uh, PJ Crip guy. Um, it, at that time, you know, Imperial, of course, was known for gang activity in a sense. Because back in even my day, when I was raised in the Imperial Court, we didn't have these street gangs like they had now and these guys. I used to call them cowards when I did my uh, presentation about the uh, drive-by shootings and stuff. See, this was right after, what, the Vietnam War and stuff, and a lot of guys went <clears throat> to Vietnam, and they learned this uh, hit-and-run type of uh, retaliation or attacks and stuff like that. So a lot of them got drafted, went to Vietnam and stuff, and came back with that training and before you knew it, these Crips and brothers that was really getting started started doing these drive-by shootings. And I used to call them <coughs> cowards because I said, you guys aren't facing your enemy. Back in our day, you had them uh, Imperial Courts uh, were the uh, Orientals, Nicholson Gardens were the Huns, uh, Jordan Downs were the Savalians. We had little, we used to call them social clubs, but they were literally young, misguided youth that would get into uh, riots and stuff, but they never used any guns or stuff. We always fought. Brass knuckles maybe, and the worst thing was probably a bumper jack or something, but you act literally facing the person that you're having a problem with. you you fighting them. But then when all this drive-by shooting and they started involving people's uh, family, their mamas and sisters getting shot, I used to tell them that was very cowardice. And um, uh, I didn't particular care for that type of uh, confrontation. So, but these guys were involved in a lot of that. And you had a lot of uh, PJ Cripps uh, got caught up in, in that. Uh, I remember 
what's my man now? I was trying to think of two little brothers, A. Neil Clark and Junebug Clark. They got caught up in this dope stuff and this Crip and stuff. But they were sort of like PJ Crips that come to mind. <clears throat> but like I said, that was back middle 70s, early 80s. Yeah, can you tell me a little bit about how the bounty hunters and the PJs hooked up and, and if you know about any stories from them? Oh, yeah. Um, like I said, it was just kicking up all this uh, rivalry and PJs formally, formalizing their little PJ Crips. But naturally, their main rivalries were the other projects. They had a uh, main rival was uh, the bounty hunters, which were Nickerson Gardens uh, housing project. The other rival group were uh, in Jordan Down, Grape Street. Uh, but the main rival were the Pyrus, uh bounty hunters. And so they started getting into shooting. In a, but I really didn't investigate any of that for the most part because they were LAPD's jurisdiction. However, a lot of those cats <laughs> would venture into Compton, either PJ Crips or either bounty hunters and we might have had a few incidents between them in our city, but most of the rivalry was between the two projects. But I more or less consulted or was consulted by 77th Street Games, the crash unit and stuff, who knew I knew a lot of those guys because Edward McGowan, a manpower, was a shot caller over there in Nickerson. And as I said, it, before he got killed, Anthony Blaylock and them was. So I would help them kind of get information and try to talk them down or tell them who's who or, or what. But that, it was a tremendous uh, rivalry, back and forth shootings that LAPD, Southeast Division, had to deal with between the Bloods. Now, every now and then, then the Crips on Crips thing started where PJs were getting into it with the Grape Streets, cats that uh, uh, back in uh, Jordan Down Project area. Uh, the big name over there, naturally, is Honcho. Uh, Wayne Day and stuff, but Wayne never was a banger. Like, he had a lot of influence over the uh, Jordan now, but he kind of, you know, had a lot tied into the the, uh, the drug tra trafficking thing. Uh, so, but you had shootings between them two. But those, like I say, weren't directly Compton PD incidents. But by my knowledge of all of them, I had to work along a task force or what with LAPD to help solve some of those back and forth uh, rivalry. And the Joy Nows especially would come to uh, Compton with incidents because Wayne's brother got killed when they were trying to jack him over there on Alondra and Long Beach Boulevard. Wayne's brother had uh, those Dayton rims and some Southsiders tried to jack, well not try, they did jack and kill uh, uh, Huncho's brother uh, trying to get his Dayton and then uh, subsequently got information that who was involved was a kid that uh, it's actually Samoan who wanted to jump in or be part of Southside who who jacked Wayne's brother. And we found out really through the help of Wayne's family <laughs> who the suspect was. And I caught him one day trying to go in the house. The suspect, uh, he was a youngster, big old youngster. I think he was a juvenile at the time he, he did the shooting and saw him going into his house and arrested him. He ended up confessing to the whole incident. Uh, Back there, that was a a, a Grape Street thing. Because Grape Street knew he was from Southside, and that started a bunch of shootings back and forth between Southside and Grape Street Crips back during that time. So that kind of stuck out with me for a while. Okay. Um, uh, we had heard the story about uh, Mob James and Big Rock having a fight at a park um, where it was going to be potentially worse, but you actually stepped in and said, if you guys, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the, the gist of it was you had them fight so that it wouldn't escalate into something worse. Is that accurate? And can you tell oh, uh, your side uh, of the story? That was uh, one of the hallmarks in my career of, of, of gang activity, dealing with a gang activity that didn't come out so well for me from my supervisor's standpoint. As a matter of fact, it got me challenged. And as I look back on it, rightfully so, from an administrative standpoint. But me being unorthodox and able to do certain things that the average police couldn't have gotten away with, uh, that particular day, I think I had a rookie with me. 
at the time, a trainer. I shouldn't say well, he's a rookie, but he was a, a trainee, Henry Robertson. Henry Robertson and I were riding together in a call came out of possible gang fight at Luda's Park. And actually, they weren't fighting, but when we arrived, myself and Henry arrived there, they were going at each other just talking. We used to call it woofing and going back like, like they want to fight right in the middle of the gym field. And I found out that the rivalry was between the Ma Piru guys and the Elm Lane Pyrus, who really associated more with Luther's Park. And the Luther Park guys and the Elm Lane guys were kind of beefing it with the mob guys. And uh, the main guy from mob that was over there, kind of was Mob James. And from uh, Elm Lane was Rock Chisholm. And um, they they were about to, you know, just all out FIFA. I mean, some of them had sticks in their hands and I, I, no doubt weapons in their possession, I'm sure. I, I, Henry and I getting out, and I think it was like at least 35 or 40 on each set, on each side, you know, a big crowd of nothing but gangbangers. And I go, oh, my God, you know, I'm about to have one of them old-fashioned rock. So I got out, you know, and I had to demand some attention and, and show some some presence, some, you know. So I start talking here, come approaching the group. Hey, uh, get back. What's all this and all this? So naturally, the cat, oh, Red, just between us and, you know, this and that and, uh, uh, rock. Hey, man, you ain't gonna stop nothing. We got to, we gonna, we gonna get this on. We're tired and, go, oh, wait a minute. They ain't, we ain't gonna have none of this. We, ain't. at that time, I didn't call for any backup or anything. I didn't feel uncomfortable. I felt that I can control the situation. And I was, you know, calm them down. They weren't like going right at each other, but mob and rock were, you know. And so I remember the first day, Rock Chisholm said, looked at me and said, hey, that, we ain't gonna just end like this. Rock, Rock got to get his rocks off. Rock's got to get his rocks off. I looked at him and I, I wanted to laugh, but then I looked at James and James was just as pissed. I mean, you know, hey, let's get it on. So the crazy thing came in, Reggie Wright Sr. the head was, shit, let him fight. If I could control this and them two, as Rock said, get his rocks off, I can de-escalate this whole situation where it don't turn into a full-scale riot and I have to draw every police in Compton and probably sheriff here. Yeah, that was going through me. So I said, okay, if I let y'all get it off, then I want y'all to spit up and go away. And nobody's getting involved but just you two. And they agreed. And I said, and I said okay. Henry kind of pushed the others, the Pyrus back a little bit. I know he did the Elm Lane, and I did the mob guys and backed them up, and they started fighting. And I mean, you know, nobody was trying to jump in or anything, but one of my coworkers, police officers, was standing over by the gym uh, entrance with the gymnasium, because we were on the street side, the Rosecrans side, but you could see everything. And one of the little directors, and I understand his concern, he was a little young <coughs> guy, oh, Tony, uh, uh, he was concerned about him fighting, you know, when he saw him fighting. And I think he convinced an uh, officer that was there, I'm not going to say his name, but who was kind of scared any darn way, because instead of being over there with us, he was standing over there by the office, convinced him to put out a code nine, also need help. And before you knew it, as they were fighting, you can hear police cars coming from everywhere, you know, over there. But they had got enough off of their chest and they heard the police cars as well, and they split up. Elm went their way, backed into the park. Miles went across the street, and they went their way. That evening, and this was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 or 5 o'clock, I had no problems whatsoever between the two groups. No incidents, no retaliation, no shooting or anything. So I felt good about that. But boy, my supervisor, who rolled on that, found out that I, more or less, was refereeing, re refereeing the fight and stuff. Man, they tore up me and down me. I'm surprised I didn't get suspended, but they respected me. Uh, Sergeant Malachi was a female sergeant. And the chief, my buddy, Yuri Taylor, was my lieutenant. But I mean, <laughs> I, 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 if I had to do that again, I don't know if I would have let it go that way. 
But uh, I probably wouldn't knowing me. I probably would. But anyhow, that wasn't the best thing to do. I, I put the city at a uh, liability and them. But it resolved the issue without a big mob, mob, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> just fighting right there in the park. And that would have involved police officers and everybody. So that was my big uh, <laughs> recollection of that incident. I, I think about that frequently, <laughs> that situation. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you were the supervisor on a task force that was able to solve the Kevin Burrell, um, Jim McDonald homicide? Um, can you tell me how that played out and how that happened? Okay. Um, naturally, we all was taken aback when that incident occurred, I think it was 91 or 92, 2000, uh, where Kevin was working that night. At, you know, he was one of our regular patrol officers. Kevin Burrell was a general giant, one of these big guys, you know, played basketball and every bit of about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, 200 pounds, good kid. Uh, and he was working with a reserve police officer that night. And um, he and his partner, uh, Clark, I mean, Clark, James, uh, that was his last night, last night. Uh, his last name was McDonald, uh, James McDonald. It was his last night as working as a cop to police reserve, and that was a Friday night. He was due to report to San Jose PD as a regular police officer that Monday. He wanted to ride with Kevin, who technically was on the desk that particular night because he had a bad bad will, you know, but he wanted to ride so badly with Kevin, one more ride, that the watch commander, Danny Sneed, allowed Kevin to go work the last night. I guess Danny probably had his finger crossed and hoped they didn't get into anything, you know, because of his limitations, Burrell's. And unfortunately, uh, they ended up making a, a traffic stop at Rosecrans and Dwight on a kid from Nicholson Garden uh, named Regis Thomas. Uh, and they uh, pulled a traffic stop in the rain just to check the kid out because I guess he was speeding or something. But Regis uh, was armed, he had a gun on him and uh, probably some dope, no doubt. I think it was some dope in the truck, no doubt. Uh, when they pulled him over, Kevin approached Regis, got him, put him up against his truck to start searching him and stuff. And James, you know, stayed in his position on the other side and watching him. And I guess when Kevin went to, not guess, but the evidence kind of showed that when Kevin went to reach to check the front of Regis for a weapon, Regis pulled the weapon and uh, ended up pushing Kevin back, which with that bad will, Kevin kind of fell back and Regis started shooting Kevin. James, on the other end, I think fired a shot at uh, Regis from across Kevin falls down, and uh, Regis goes around the truck and go right at, at James and shoot James. He falls to the ground, and then uh, Regis goes right up to James on the ground and just shoots him point blank, gets in his truck, a red truck, and takes off. Now, this was 1030 or something that night in the rain, hardly no traffic going down roads, just a few people, and thank God, one of the people that Pass was one of our records clerk that got at least saw the stop and saw Kevin trying to search this guy. But she kept on, not knowing that they were going to get shot. She continued. And so that's how we had a witness to the shooting and stuff. But that turned out to be a real hectic night. But we ended up starting looking all over everywhere for this red truck, identified as the one was stopped, trying to get information. Uh, we kind of surmised that night that the shooter was probably from the Nicholson Garden area, but we never found a red truck that night. So naturally, we com com comprised the task force that involved uh, local municipalities, L.A. County sheriffs, uh, LAPD. Everybody became part of this task force. Task force. And uh, I was kind of the lead street investigator, uh, but we had L.A. County Sheriff detectives from Homicide Unit, my friend Bumcrop, 
and uh, the sergeant, and they could they more or less coordinated the sheriff's end of it, Compton PD end of it, LAPD was part of it as well, and we went back and forth for for weeks and months, solved a lot of other cases, you know, looking for leads or or get people involved to give us some leads to it, but we found a guy who was related. No, he was, his cousin was related to the shooter, Regent. And apparently he had gotten rid of the, uh, Cal, Calvin Cooksey. He had gotten rid of the gun that was used a month later. And uh, he got caught in a crime in Hollywood. And naturally he wanted to turn off the information to get himself off of that. And he did. <coughs> we recovered the gun, did that investigation, subsequently got Regis Thomas uh, convicted, who's on death row till today. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> regarding that shooting, but it took us almost a couple of a couple of months before all that was worked up in order to arrest the guys, uh, the guy involved, and he was like like I said from Bounty Hunter, but he wasn't a a gangbanger. Regis Thomas, that was kind of that is uh, investigation. Um, can you tell me about if you have any memorable stories from um, when the L.A. riots? were happening? All right. Uh, on the, the night of the, the 92 riots or insurrection or whatever they wanted to call it, uh, I was coming home from the Laker game and stuff and noticed in South L.A., around Manchester area and stuff, they were burning stores and doing some looting. I didn't know what that was about until I turned on a, a news station and found out that people were revolting because of the acquittal of, of the officers that was... Uh, uh, involved in, in the Rodney King incident, got acquitted that evening. And uh, I guess as part of the re, uh, them guys rebelling and stuff, they pulled that gentleman out of his tractor trailer around Broadway in Manchester, at Reginald Denny. They had uh, kind of beat him up and stuff, and one thing led to another, and you start having all these incidents. It subsequently um, continued, all through the night, and then when I got to Compton area, they started the, the rioting and looting and stuff in the Compton area. And that type of stuff lasted for about two days or so or longer before we got control of it. Because I remember we, uh, meaning the city of Compton, had had control of the uh, hotel right there on the, the uh, Ramada. It was the Ramada Inn, I think, at that time. The big hotel right uh, uh, by the 91 freeway. And so we made that a command post and brought in the National Guard and other agencies and and that was that was really a crazy time doing that. But um, eventually that was resolved um, after a few days or so. Um, can you tell me uh, from your perspective? why the Compton PD and the politics behind it, why it was absorbed by the L.A. County Sheriff's Department? Well, actually, rumors or people were trying to, when I say people, meaning uh, politicians within the city and some of the community had an outcry for the L.A. County Sheriff to come and take over Compton PD. That type of Concerns started way back in the 70s or 80s. With, but the city was always strong in backing the local police. Uh, and uh, even though people bought feasibility studies and stuff, saying it's best to bring the county in to service. But uh, the city wanted to maintain, basically the community wanted to maintain their own police department. And they always fought that off. But that start coming back, that uh, proposition, uh, proposal, start coming back around when uh, Omar Bradley became mayor in his council. Uh, they felt as though the Compton Police Department weren't doing what they wanted to do, but that was just wanted them to do or doing enough to combat crime and stuff and figure the L.A. County Sheriff would be best to serve us. Start bringing that proposal back, and it got strong. And they start proposing a lot of things in terms of the, the police department, uh, bad apples or anything that was going on kind of negatively, and try to make it a big thing. 
and they wanted to get rid of the Compton Police Department. And they later on, they were able to muster enough council votes, although the community at that time was kind of split into whether or not they wanted to transition over to the Sheriff's Department. But it happened. <coughs> I think uh, it finally came to head in 2000. I think our last day as Compton Police Department was September around the 19th or the 20th of, of 2000. And then we were assimilated into the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Um, when we did the transition over to L.A. County Sheriff's Department in two, September 2000, prior to all that, as I aforementioned, you know, the community and the, the politicians over the years often considered assimilating into the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. So way before my time in the 60s or so. It finally didn't pick up some steam until uh, the Bradley administration came in about uh, 97 and 98. Uh, and they were pretty strong. And uh, they start more or less, I don't want to say if they were like not trusting the Compton Police Department, but uh, I know personally that Omar Bradley wasn't too happy and the city manager wasn't too happy with the Compton Police Department in 1998 area and stuff. And he started really entertaining uh, going over to the Sheriff's Department. And he later on got enough votes on the council to really start phases. Um, and his kind of, as I saw it, his kind of, uh, belief about it and this hearing, uh, hearing from the administration, our administration that, uh, the politicians, council and the mayor through the city manager was a little concerned about the FBI investigating the city, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, and I think, uh, the, the council and the mayor felt as though that the chief of police was cooperating uh, with the uh, FBI in the investigation and didn't like that. Uh, <clears throat> I don't believe that was true, but I don't know because I wasn't that high in a minute, but that was the concern. <clears throat> and so uh, Omar really uh, believed in that and got the council to believe it. They uh, finally, in 2000, decided to transition uh, uh, or at least contract the sheriff department for the services and the pretense to the city was basically it would save more money, uh, you know, because the basic uh, choice for the sheriff department, don't hold me to the figures. I'm just give you a, a little example of the figure was like about the budget for the police department was about 16 million or something like that, that we had, uh, but the sheriff department, it may be higher. But whatever it was, the sheriff department undercut the budget that we had. But our budget was cons it was constructed with not just patrol services. It was constructed with patrol services, auxiliary services, clerical services, support services. All that was total. It's coming to me now. Maybe it was about nineteen million or something. But the sheriff department came in with about a sixteen million thing. That was the reason why they say they really should go. But in that 16 million budget, that was just basic police with so many cars and all that. But any auxiliary uh, programs or, or or units, you had to pay extra. But the city didn't find all that out until they run once they contracted, and all of a sudden the sheriff budget got up to 20 something million. They realized that 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 the community, I'm sure, also realized it wasn't cheaper. But they wanted uh, they wanted us out basically, that administration. And they voted us out and we went. And they made all kinds of allegations about corruption and certain incidents and and all that, but they called us the corrupted ones and so, but half know. of the county. Later on, the same sheriff department that they brought in investigated the council, you know, all of them got arrested, although all of them weren't guilty of anything. They did get arrested, the whole council. And I was thankful that a couple of them they exonerated them. They, they weren't involved, but for the main part, the ones that were, lack of a better word, conspiring to get rid of us, uh, they ended up with cases. So that was, I felt, the interesting part of that. But 
things work out, we're okay. But that happened in 2000, uh, you know, assimilation into the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. So after the um, Compton PD was absorbed, what did a lot of the officers that were Compton Police Department officers, what did they end up doing afterwards? Oh, I think shoot, almost 90% of us got hired by the sheriff's department. I mean, a few guys went to other departments. You know, they didn't want to go to L.A. County. And some of them went over to Rialto and Inglewood, a couple of other local departments. They all got jobs. Uh, I don't think anyone, maybe a couple officers that were being investigated by our department for whatever, I don't think they got hired by the sheriff's department because of their pending uh, investigations. But the majority of us ended up at the sheriff's department and spent most of the career. Some of them are still there at L.A. County Sheriff. So if we were corrupted as the council or mayor was uh, putting out, uh, sheriff's department would have vetted all that and find out and those that were, if really tied in anything, wouldn't have gotten hired. Uh, so that was just a premise that they were trying to put out because uh, Bradley wanted to get rid of the thing because he had a division uh, issue with the chief and uh, all that. But again, tying into what I talked about earlier, they wanted us out. We were supposed to be so corrupted, but a year or so later, the whole council got uh, arrested because of what they felt was corrupt activity on the council part. Although all of them weren't caught up in there. Matter of fact, the female council people definitely weren't part of whatever they was doing or was found because they were they were exonerated from that. As a matter of fact, they weren't even charged. So anyway, that's kind of how things got a little crazy with the uh, assimilation into the sheriff's department. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I have one more question, and that is, if you have any uh, stories that you can remember in regards to uh, Brennan and Ladd. Well, I got a lot of stories about that. We could be here all day talking about those two. Uh, those were my main uh, street investigators uh, over the years. You know, I had some good ones that worked in the unit. Uh, Ray Richardson, Eddie Aguirre, uh, Aleppi, and a lot of guys come to my mind. Uh, one of my first guys, uh, man, I'm having a mental block about his name. Uh, you no, know, uh, uh, Hispanic guy, because I need a, a Spanish speaking guy. Uh, yeah, John Pena. He was one of the initial gang guys. So we had a lot of guys, but Brendan and Ladd stood out uh, uh, in, in their investigation. Now, I had a big guy that kind of started with me when we first got started, but he ended up early going out to a task force with FBI, Mark Anderson. Uh, he uh, was one of them. I think me and Mark was the first one after Beckman had left to go to Chino. Uh, got it. But the main investigative unit during all that time, in I would say from 82 on, you know, were the guys I'm talking about now. And Brendan and Lad were unique in that they had investigative skills and were able to get a lot of informants and make a lot of arrests and stuff because they were two white guys. These were two white guys from other communities that were able to be savvy enough to work uh, with other races uh, in terms of investigating blacks, Hispanics. They, they were just, you know, I used to call them my two white illegitimate kids. Uh, they... They, they took care of business. Unfortunately, we lost uh, Brennan, who, who was known as Blondie, all, all over a year ago, and uh, he's truly missed. Uh, but Bobby is still around, and he ended up going to Garden Grove. He was one of the ones uh, that went to the sheriff's department for a minute and then ended up going to Garden Grove and became a gang sergeant out there and stuff, just recently retired. But those two, I mean, investigative skills, getting information, <laughs> Uh, from blacks, Hispanics, solving cases, writing search warrants. I mean, uh, they were top, top of the line, uh, both of them.